And uh, we will pass on to our next speaker, who is uh, Professor Genevieve Langdon. And um, it's a great pleasure to uh, introduce uh, an old friend. Uh, Genevieve has over 20 years of experience researching the failure of structures and materials subjected to explosion, explosion loading with particular interest in lightweight materials. She takes a multidisciplinary approach to understanding this multifaceted problem and is interested in every aspect of the blast event chain. Her goal is to make the world a safer place by mitigating the harmful and devastating effects of explosions on people, equipment and infrastructure. Uh, Professor Langdon is the secretary of the International Society of Impact and Engine Engineering. She sits on the editorial board of the International Journal of Impact Engineering and the Journal of Thin Wall Structures. She's a member of several scientific advisory committees for international conferences in impact, strain analysis, and defense subjects. And on that, I'll pass over to you, Genevieve. Thank you very much, Wesley. It's an honor to be invited to this advanced material seminar, and I'm sure it won't be the last one. And um, thank you to Mohammed and his team at TII for organizing this event. And um, before I speak to you today, I just wanted to acknowledge my collaborators and co-authors, um, as well as the numerous students I've worked with over the years on this topic. Much of the insight and the hard work belongs to them and the mistakes belong to me. Um, those of you who recognize my name might associate me with Bishri with the University of Cape Town, where I spent 15 happy years working on the blast response of structures, particularly lightweight materials such as fiber metal laminates, lattice structures, sandwich materials, and fiber reinforced polymers, all the kinds of materials we've been hearing about today. Um, in the interest of time though, I'll only talk about fiber reinforced polymer composites and air blast loading. Um, earlier this year, I moved from Cape Town to Sheffield although I maintain close links with Bisri through an honorary professorship there. Um, and I expect there may be one or two of the, of the crew um, in the audience today. So warm welcome to you. Uh, this is Sheffield. Uh, for those of you who aren't familiar with where Sheffield is, um, it's a, the Blast and Impact Group at Sheffield are unique among UK universities in that they have experimental facilities for exploding high explosives on campus. Sheffield is in the north of England and on the screen you can see the Buxton test site, which is 50 kilometers west of Sheffield. It's capable of explosive detonation tests from a few grams up to kilogram scale TNT equivalent experiments. We've got high speed cameras, a characterization of blast loading facility, instrumentation, etc., that allow the detailed measurements of response and loading that are necessary to understand how structures perform it when um, a blast event occurs. I should probably point out that the picture on your screen was taken during the summer and we're now deep into winter so the site is not quite as inviting as it looks on the screen although to those of you in the UAE who perhaps have never experienced any snow that is something that we do get from time to time in Sheffield. Um, so I don't really need to introduce this topic to all of you as you're all very involved in, in this kind of uh, work, but fiber reinforced polymers are composite materials with polymer matrices reinforced with fibers. I've got a couple of examples on the screen in case you haven't seen them before. The material properties of these sorts of materials are, are influenced by, among other things, the type of fiber, and I've got a couple of different types on the screen there, uh, whether it's glass or carbon or aramid, or in this case, graphite. Um, the polymer resin used, such as an epoxy or a polyester or peak or polyurethane. Um, the weave type, if it's woven unidirectional, you know, what type of weave and what size of weave you have. The layup of the materials, the manufacturing process. So you can imagine that, that understanding the full micromechanics of these systems is quite complicated. And we had an excellent talk earlier from Professor Deshpande looking at some of those differences between UD and um, and not 90 degree woven structures, for example. Um, on the right hand side of the screen, you can see HB26, which is one of the materials that, one of the suite of Dyneema materials that um, Vikram was speaking about. That's an ultra high molecular weight polyethylene fiber embedded in a matrix. And I put that one on the screen to show you the difference between the fibers at 090. So at the little round circles, you can see our fibers that are, are coming out of the screen towards you. And the sort of gray brown layer that you can see going across, those are fibers laid at 90 degrees to that. This sort of alternating sequence is called a 090 cross by configuration. 
Um, if you have a look at on the left-hand side of the screen, you can see graphite epoxy um, fiber reinforced polymer where the graphite fibers are, are magnified at a greater magnification than you see in the Dyneema to give you an idea of what they look like. The point of showing you this is that we tend to idealize these things um, but in reality, uh, they're not evenly spaced out um, and things are not quite as perfect as they are in our models. Um, but these materials are incredibly useful, partly because there are so many ways to vary their properties and that lets you tailor them for different applications. They have high specific stiffness and strength um, and their tailorability is really key to their use. Now, in our world today, some structures are designed to withstand blast loads, such as landmine protected vehicles or the kinds of things you saw Vikram talking about, because they operate during, say, peacekeeping or demining operations. But there are many structures that have been designed without consideration of blast loading. And unfortunately, today, the threat of terrorism or industrial accidents, such as the Beirut explosion, you can see a picture on the screen of, of the map of how the Beirut explosion uh, uh, devastated areas of the Beirut harbour. And um, we recently did some analysis on that. If you'd like to have a look at it, to have a look at, we used high speed, we used video footage that people uploaded to Twitter to analyze how big the explosion must have been. Um, but when you see these sorts of events happening year on year and it's different places, it's different kinds of accidents, different kinds of terrorist events. It makes me think not just about explosions and materials for defense, but also the kinds of materials that used every day that we don't think of as blast mitigation materials and how they would respond. So some of the materials I might show you today, you might not think of as uh, blast resistant materials. They might be more everyday materials, but we still uh, would help us to know how they would respond in the event of an explosion situation. So what do I do? So I like to test fiber reinforced polymers under control conditions uh, using small um, explosive, plastic explosive charges detonated at predetermined positions away from the structure of interest. Sometimes that structure is mounted to a ballistic pendulum so we can infer the impulse transferred, which is the method that we've been using for years at the University of Cape Town. My colleagues at Sheffield have developed a different way of, of looking at spatial impulse distribution by using an array of small Hopkinson bars embedded in a rigid target. And joint work between Bizzer and Sheffield has shown that both of these approaches produce reliable results. But the easiest way to talk to you about what happens to a fiber reinforced material when it's subjected to air blast is to show you some. Um, so on the screen, I've shown you a typical glass fiber epoxy panel. Um, you can see uh, two images there from two different tests. You're looking at the the rear side of, of a panel in those two squares at the top of the screen. The exposed area is the circular part with the white scoring around the edges. And what I hope you can see there is the brown corners are the original color of the glass fiber epoxy and the whitened area on the inside of the loaded section has delaminated considerably. That's why it's whitened in case you're wondering. So the Z value is a measure that a way that we look at scaling an explosion. So Z would go lower as you increase a charge mass because it's sort of it's a scaled distance. So the, the lower the Z value, the more extreme the loading in terms of explosions. And so the lower Z value on the right hand side uh, shows a more extreme failure where you've got a, a diamond of delamination that is extremely white, even whiter than the other delaminations on the left hand side. And hopefully right in the center, you can see uh, that there's some fiber rupture there. Um, if you go down to the bottom image on your screen, which is where we take that panel on the right hand side, cut it in half and have a look at the cross section, you can see multiple delaminations, multiple fiber fractures happening. Um, and uh, this is a very common material, glass fiber epoxy, um, that we would use for, for looking at uh, we use it in all kinds of applications out there, marine applications, boat building, for example, might use some glass fiber epoxies and glass fiber polyester kinds of materials. So uh, the reason for showing you this is to give you some sense of the kinds of material uh, failures that we might be looking at. This is a very brittle type response to very extreme high rate loading. You see matrix cracking, delamination, fiber fracture, fiber matrix debonding, through thickness rupture and mixed mode failures extremely difficult to model computationally if you want to try and model this at some sort of scale of modeling that allows you to do engineering design. Um, and we've already heard that this morning from some of the other speakers when looking at impact applications. 
So glass fiber epoxy is a synthetic material and the world is rightly looking for more sustainable and greener options. And I'm currently supervising a student in Cape Town who's looking at alternative sustainable materials. So in the panels you're seeing on the screen, we looked at the effect of different natural fibers on uh, compared to an equivalent mass glass fiber epoxy uh, because our glass fiber epoxy is sort of one of the baseline materials we use. As the natural fibers were considerably lighter than glass, this meant that the flax and jute panels, which are shown on the screen there, um, were much thicker than the glass fiber because we looked at this on an equivalent mass basis. So you can see that the amount of explosives we're using is six grams, very small charges. And I've got on the left hand side, the greenish image is glass fiber prime 20, which is a marine grade epoxy uh, resin. Uh, subjected to a seven gram charge. So this is essentially equivalent conditions, except the glass fiber is a slightly higher charge mass. You can see the, the sort of whitened areas on the panels, those are cracks, extensive cracks. And in the bottom left-hand corner, you can see green and, and red lines. Uh, that is the mapping of the, of the cracks on the rear surface for the Duke Prime 20 panel seen on the screen. So we can take these sort of crack um, patterns and we can uh, measure them and, and have a look at how they, how they change with charge masses to get some idea of what's going on in the materials. So the flex and jute panels have ruptured at lower charge masses, even though they're so much thicker than the glass fiber. It's, they're very brittle and they exhibit low strength compared to glass fiber. Uh, fiber cracking is their dominant failure mode, whereas in glass fiber, delamination is a more extensive failure mechanism. And the reason why it's so important experimentally to try and determine which of the dominant failure mechanisms is because when we come to model these things, it's important to know where to put our computational effort. Um, so with a natural fiber, such as the one shown on the screen, these sorts of combinations of fiber and resin, you would be looking to try and mo uh, model cracking more accurately. In glass yeah. fiber, you might be looking to look at delamination. Something else we've had a look at is the epoxy type. Um, we've been able to substitute the marine grade synthetic epoxy prime 20 for a bio epoxy system called SuperSlap. And we found that the resin difference had a minimal effect on its blast resistance. And that's a good outcome because the bio epoxy resin is a more environmentally sustainable option. We're going to publish this work soon, um, including some transient response that I haven't got time to show you today in the near future as, as the student completes their writing. Uh, this is some collaborative work with a PhD student of Wesley some years ago. Dr. Yaya is now an academic based in Malaysia. And in these experiments, we had a look at near field explosive detonations in glass fiber and carbon fiber laminates with, with a polyether imide um, resin system. The cross section on the right shows a typical failure. Uh, so you're, you're having a look at the cross section, you can see cracking um, fiber fracture through most of the layers, if not all of them, and some inter delamination, interlayer delamination. The graph shows the impulse required to cause different levels of failure in the composites. The crosses indicate the first impulse at which the fiber damage was observed. So you can see the crosses here. Hopefully you can see my, my arrow pointing at them. And you can see that they, they increase almost linearly with different laminate thicknesses. The circles indicate complete failure of the laminate. And if there's an arrow on the screen, it indicates that we weren't able to get complete failure in the, in the tests that we performed, that they were, so you're showing the highest impulses there and showing that there is still some more uh, failure capacity in them. That also increases roughly linearly. The interesting one there is that you've got a comparison between glass and carbon, um, at just over four millimeters thick plate thickness. And you can see that the glass fiber panel has significantly more capacity to absorb energy after first failure, uh, but prior to complete perforation um, than the carbon fiber system did. So our blast work seems to indicate the glass fiber panels are more blast resistant than carbon fiber and, and some early testing showed Kevlar as well was also inferior to glass. And this is probably because of the slightly increased ductility of the glass fiber. So now instead of this, the carbon fiber PEI panels that we saw in the last slide, we're now going to compare them to carbon fiber epoxy systems of equivalent mass. If you have a look at the graph on your screen, which shows the lengths of the fractures that we saw in the material compared uh, against the impulses applied, where impulses are roughly equivalent to charge mass size, you can see that there's no particular influence um, of the polymer matrix on the failure in response. 
So this illustrates for us the dominance of the fiber over the resin in blast response. Um, and in fiber systems such as glass and, and carbon, this is very typical. The photograph shows the carbon fiber fan, panel has sheared around the boundary edges and has some cracking in the center. But apart from this damage, the permanent displacement of the fiber reinforced polymer isn't visible. The disc appears to be flat. Because of the elasticity in the polymer um, material, uh, understanding the transient behavior would be critical. But at this point in our um, test career, we didn't have the ability to measure the transient deformation of a system such as this one. Using two high-speed cameras um, and digital image correlation, we've been able to develop systems that can measure the transient response of panels subjected to these kinds of loads. And the system at UCT is able to measure a strip across the midline of a structure uh, with typical recording speeds of 30 to 40,000 um, frames a second. So the UCT high-speed video camera system would be mounted to a pendulum and Richard and I are in the process of setting up a similar system at Sheffield but using static cameras uh, without a, a pendulum. Uh, we're going to try and develop a full field transient measurement system capable of also providing the full field initial velocity field of the deformable structure subject to a blast loading. And that's being funded as part of an EPSEG strategic equipment grant. So if you're interested in doing anything in experimental blast loading, structural response and material response, we'd be looking for partners for joint research proposals involving state-of-the-art diagnostics. So I uh, look forward to hearing from you. Right, on with the talk. So here are some photographs of the front and back faces of an approximately 16 millimeter thick S2 glass fiber phenolic resin panel. These panels are opaque. Um, unlike the other glass fiber panel epoxy systems, which you saw, which were slightly translucent. This was loaded by detonating 75 grams of PE4 at a 50 millimeter standoff distance, which is the limit of the UCT BISRU um, blast laboratory. So this is about as, as big a load as we can get at UCT under very controlled uh, small scale lab conditions. In these tests, the, the clamp frame was square rather than circular, and the exposed area is larger than the work with Professor Campbell. You know, there's typically 300 by 300 or 400 by 400 millimeters and could be used for this kind of scale of experiment. But you can see that the observed failure modes are very similar. You've got delamination of the, of the layers, you've got fiber rupture, loss of material when the loading is very intense in the center of the panel uh, rather than backed off further away. Um, fiber rupture. And if you see, uh, because of the higher thickness of these particular panels, we also see some other effects. On the right hand side, on, when you're looking now at the back surface, you can see that there's some buckling. The panel surface appears to be wavy. And, and the material that's been lost in the center on the left hand side is due to fireball interaction with the material. And um, because the Z, the scale distance is extremely close. This is a very, very near field explosion, meaning that the fireball itself will interact with the material. And in this case, potentially burn some of it away. So on the screen now, you can see the high speed stereo imaging system that Richard and I set up and used with the help of our Bisru colleagues at UCT for the transient response measurement under blast loading conditions. Um, the rear side of the panel, which would be that the panel would be on the left hand side of that pendulum that you can see there and the cameras are in the center. Um, the panel is speckled. So you typically you paint it white and you speckle uh, black speckles onto the panel. And by using DIC, um, you can look at, at the two sets of films of those speckles and identify movement of the speckle panel in those two images in each time frame and therefore reconstruct the deformation time response of the speckled region of the panel. And that allows us to do these sorts of measurements. So this is that S2 glass fiber phenolic panel that I showed you a few moments ago, loaded at three different charge masses, 40, 50 and 60 grams. We did this work in collaboration with our DST Australia partners. Um, and hopefully what you can see here is you can see three colored lines, red, blue, and green. Those are the transient responses. They peak between 30 and 40 millimeters um, in the direction of in which the blast is moving. And then you can see after they peak, they rebound and they go down to, to negative displacements, which means they've deformed in the direction um, 
towards the blast. So in the opposite direction to which you would imagine a structure would move when it's subjected to a blast load. The dotted lines that are, are, are non-variant with time that are plotted across the middle, which are at about minus five or minus six millimeters, those are the permanent deflections of the panel measured afterwards, after the testing is totally completed. So a few things you can see here is that that reverse snap buckling that we saw, that wavy surface that you saw on the images a moment ago, um, produces negative displacements, um, so opposite to the direction of the blast loading, um, which, which it, we're seeing experimentally as well as just observing with our naked eye afterwards. But we can see a few other things too. We can see that the transient displacements are much larger than the permanent response where the peak displacements between 32 and 40 millimeters and the peak negative displacements even are between 20 and 30 millimeters. These are significantly higher than the permanent displacement response. So these results demonstrate why, why measuring transient response in fiber reinforced polymers is so critical, uh, given that we're getting up to 10 times as much permanent, um, as much as the permanent displacement uh, at our two peaks. So what I'm gonna show you now is just a few more um, displacement time histories. The same kind of panel, this time we've got a slightly closer standoff distance and we've reduced the charge mass accordingly. And what we see here is the same sort of thing in as much as we've got some peak display, we've got some permanent displacements going across the screen again, this time they're positive. So if all you had were the permanent deflection measurements and not the transient response measurements, you would say that this 40, 50, 60 grams at a 50 millimeter standoff produces negative displacements of five or six millimeters, and you would know nothing else about it. And when you reduce the standoff distance and reduce the charge mass, you get positive displacements of say between five and eight millimeters. However, if you look at the transient responses now, these are very different to what we were seeing a moment ago. So the blue line, which is at 30 grams, is quite similar to what we saw for the 40 and 50 gram tests at a slightly larger standoff. But at 20 grams, you see that the response is significantly different. In this case, the peak negative um, rebound uh, displacement is greater than the original peak positive displacement. And unlike the other panels where the reverse snap through buckling seems to result in a permanent deflection in the negative direction. In this case, the, you can see uh, that after 10 milliseconds, the transient deformation has returned to this practically zero and um, pra practically the permanent deflection. So you can see there's quite a difference in the two types of response that you see transiently. That if you didn't have the transient measurements, you would be you would think that the responses were very similar in the two panels because the permanent deflections only vary by a couple of millimeters. Remembering that these panels are 16 millimeters thick, a couple of millimeters of deflection difference it would usually be discounted um, because it, it's going to represent less than a fifth of the plate deformation, uh, the plate thickness, which is very, um, very high because it's 16 millimeters thick. Um, so, so those are some of the features that we would miss if we only looked at permanent deflections. And at the moment, this work is currently being, um, we're currently modeling it. We're currently having a look at, at the failure mechanisms in a bit more detail. And we hope to publish this work quite soon. But I just wanted to demonstrate what the differences in transient deflection, how they add a lot to um, what we're able to understand about explosions. So, this next slide I added after seeing Prof Deshpande's fantastic talk about micromechanics of a very similar material. So I don't need to say too much about why this material is so interesting as Vikram covered that really well. The system's strong, it's tough. It's been shown to be great for ballistic um, limit experiments. So we had some looks at the blast resistance. We did some early test work with Imperial College that was published back in 2014 when we were first getting going with um, our transient response uh, measurement system. We've recently done some what I consider much better experimental work on HP26 with the group from Australia. That includes a clamped boundary and transient displacement measurements. I can't say too much about the me mechanics yet as we're still analyzing and modeling the response, but I just wanted to show you a few of the 
of the features of this sort of blast response that you see in these materials. So on the front face, which is the far left image that you can see, it's, it's, um, it's been blackened because what we found when we first started testing Dyneema is that, that if you don't blacken out that face, um, it trans the blast transmits a lot of light through the composite material, making it very difficult to pick up um, the um, speckle pattern on the back side so you couldn't do such good transient response measurements. So that's why the back surface is completely black. So the area in the center that isn't completely black, that is sort of more whitish, is the original area of the Dyneema, like you can see around the clamp frame. So effectively what's happened there is the black paint has come off or been burnt off. I can't tell you which um, at this point, probably a combination of them both. Um, and you can see there a nice area of melting in the center, which is probably where the fireball interacted with the Dyneema. On the rear side, you can see that strip that I've talked about with the speckle pattern on it. You can also see um, a sort of bushy area in the center. That's a lot of fiber fracture that's happened there in the central region. There's large permanent bulging and reverse snap through buckling, which is easiest to see from the diagonally positioned image on the far right of your screen, which you can see much more just how much deformation has happened <clears throat> to that panel. Um, and a small, the small perforated section in the middle. Um, it, it's during the transient response, uh, quite a large hole opens up, but when the material rebounds, which is obviously what we've got photographed here, you can barely see the hole that's put in this panel, but I can promise you that it is there, but it virtually closes over. Uh, when you look at the broken fibers in a bit more detail uh, on just using SEM, you can see tensile stretching, necking and fibrillation. And there'll be an upcoming paper on this as well, um, as the Australians are putting the finishing touches to their modeling of this phenomena. So I'm aware that time is going quickly. Um, so I'll just do a bit of a recap and then open for questions. Um, fiber reinforced polymers under air blast loading um, produce multiple and complex failure modes. Um, they're not equally present in all different types of FRP materials or structures and they're not equally present under all loading conditions or boundary conditions either. Experiments support modeling efforts by identifying key failure types and by providing validation data. They don't necessarily represent full-scale real-life applications in every detail. Um, fiber reinforced polymers, uh, although I didn't show it in this particular talk, uh, they do tend to perform better under uniformly distributed loads Localized loading and contact explosives can be devastating for these kinds of materials. Um, really critical is that FRP transient behavior in blast cannot be overlooked. And these days we've got the experimental and instrumentation and um, setups that will allow us to measure those things. So there's no reason why they should be overlooked anymore. Uh, fiber strength and stiffness tend to dominate over resin type. Uh, with glass fiber being stronger than carbon fiber, which is stronger than natural fibers in terms of blast resistance. However, resin systems that improve the fiber matrix bonds would be advantageous. Woven FRPs are more damage tolerant than unidirectional systems, and there's a lot of potential to optimize the stacking and weave geometries to meet particular service conditions or threat levels. And new developments such as those that build on existing UM, UHM WPE systems hold a lot of potential for the future. Um, there's still many challenges ahead. The complexity of the models requiring many different failure modes, material formulations and experiments and characterizing those material failure um, formulations are a real challenge, particularly when it comes to fracture. Interpreting the experimental data from these new technologies is also a challenge. Um, and near field and contact charges are not well understood, either from the loading side or the response side. The sensitivity of these materials to these sorts of load localizations is a real challenge for the designers and the material scientists alike. And I think that with that, I will just um, stop and say thank you very much for your attention. And I'm open for some questions. Thank, thank you so much. Thank you. That was a really interesting uh, Presentation. Thank you, Genevieve. Um, we have a question here from uh, Sarah, who uh, would like to go ahead, please. Hey, Professor, uh, thank you much for the very interesting talk. I just have uh, one question regarding the material. So you have showed a lot of material that were very good in resisting uh, blast events. 
are those same material, uh, can they show the similar performance when impacted by direct impact events or, or not? And if not, what, what are the challenges associated with having a material that can resist both blast and impact events? Thank you. That's a really excellent question, Sara, because for a lot of time, it's been much easier to do impact experiments over the years than it has been to do well-instrumented blast experiments. So there are a lot of, um, there's a, a wide range of optimized materials for increasing ballistic limits, whether you're talking about composites or whether you're talking about steels. Um, because ballistic limits has been, V50 has been a very nice, neat way of ranking materials in the past, or similar sorts of systems for low speed impact. For blast, it hasn't been that way. There aren't the same sorts of uh, uni universally recognized standards for blast tests that let you rank different materials. And part of that is because of the, the complexity of the interactions of the loading types and the, the standoff distances and all of that. And um, some of the challenges for the future work is this issue of combined fragmentation and blast loading. And uh, some of the slides that Vikram showed earlier about the um, deformation mechanisms and failure mechanisms that you see in uh, fiber, woven fiber reinforced systems like Dyneema, um, I think should be applicable in the blast regime as well, um, particularly the localized blast situation, but they aren't the same. And the blast loading tends, typically tends to um, occur over um, often a, a variable time frame, so it's not quite as, um, depending on which blast load condition you're talking about, and over a wider section of the panel, and it's not going to be as uniform um, over that section of the panel necessarily. So you have, in certain blast conditions, you're going to have more input from the boundary conditions than you have in a, in a sort of a, a bullet impact test, um, where you've got, where you've got a, a bullet going through, and it's really about the material and its thickness and its interaction with the bullet, whereas and um, it's not so much about the boundary conditions, whereas in many blast experiments on panels, it's about the boundary condition as well. Um, because you've got uh, in-plane resistance, whether you're in bending or a tensile stretching mode, or you've, you've also got this interaction of um, the composite stress wave that moves through the material and then rebounds off the back surface, potentially causing spalling. So I think the way forward in the future is for those experts to work together to come up with materials that are optimized, maybe not perfectly for one or the other, but for a range of threat scenarios. Mm -hmm. um, and there needs to be open conversation about what performance measures those should be. Mm -hmm. And I think we, we, we're not having open conversations like that yet between the impactors and the blast communities, but I think that would be a useful thing for the future. Absolutely. Thank you, Professor. That's Thank a good you. idea to... Uh... Us make a seminar to discuss this point. <laughs> that, that's next year's seminar, then we're sorted. <laughs> yeah. uh, any, any further questions? You can. Yes. I, yeah, go ahead. Go ahead, John. <laughs> I have one question here. So oh. Thanks, Genevieve, for your excellent talk. Uh, the question I would like to ask you about uh, blast loading, uh, kind of in, uh, blast resistance, because the Wickram talk about uh, the impact. Uh, resistance for dilemma, so with lower uh, shear strengths, same scale gave better in the performs. How about under blast loading? Um, is uh, what kind of shear strength range do you think uh, for for like uh, you know S two or for dilemma? Um, we haven't done we haven't done any work yet where we've had to look at essentially the same material but with varying the shear strength um, because we're still at the stage of trying to understand the fundamental failure modes that go on under different mm. blast regimes um, and and I know that I mean you've done some work on looking at scaling and that that in itself in blast and looking at different thicknesses and how that affects things that's a challenge what I found when I tested the Dyneema was that there is no um there's no in-plane shear resistance. So you saw um, sheets of the Dyneema moving across sheets because of the mm. way that the resin system, I think, is constructed and the way the material is put together. 
Um, and that's, in one sense, it absorbs a lot of energy, but in another sense, it also isn't great for maintaining the structural integrity. Um, so I, th I think Vikram's onto something that there is going to be an optimization of these different things. I think shear mm -hmm. resistance is important. And the reason that most FRP composites are very bad under contact explosions is because their shear resistance is so bad. Mm. Um, yeah. so, so, but when you're further away from the explosion and you're involving more of the material in the deformation response and it's more like a membrane type action, then I think it's less important. Yeah, I mean, I, I, I the, that, that's good. I mean, another question is, you know, you mentioned for S2 glass panel, when you detonate the blast, yeah. and you get the lective deflection is higher than positive deflection. Maybe it's any, any, what kind of mechanisms here? I don't know yet. We're still looking at that. Right. Um, there, there is some, I mean, there's some old work on counterintuitive loading under impact that produces a negative deflection that Marsilio might be aware of because I think Norman worked on it for a while and mm. um, on impact about it. nobody's really talked about it in blast yet. Right. Thank you. Thank, thank you. Uh, go ahead. I, I can only see a very limited number of people here on the screen. So <laughs> relying on other people to tell me. Go ahead, Vikram. Okay, Th thank you, Genevieve. That was very interesting. Uh, the question I have is when I think of, a, and I'm only talking about because my experience is only in water blasts, not really in air blasts, is when, you're, when the blast is far away, you get an approximately a uniform impulsive load on, on the structure, and that causes a shear of fracture failure, which becomes really, very dominant. Is that true even for your sorts of air blast events um, because if that is the case then of course it's the shear off mode that becomes a dominant mode so you you do see shearing around the boundary edge um but quite often you've all depending on the strength of the material quite often you've already got some sort of tensile fiber fracture coming in other places or extensive delamination of the composite material itself so you do see extensive shearing. And I think one of the images I showed of the carbon fiber yeah. and tests that I did with Wesley shows that shearing off around the boundary edge, in which case you're right, there is a quite a, and that was at a larger standoff distance with an approximately uniform load. So shear is important. Um, it, it's just that, that those materials tend to also show um, quite extensive deformation as well as shearing. So it depends on whether you're talking about glass and carbon as well, because carbon's not as ductile, the shear is more likely. Whereas in the glass, it's very difficult to actually hold the material so tight at the edges that you don't get any in-plane movement. Yeah. My question really was to, is, was to ask the question is, is how do you define failure? I, mean, I agree with your delamination and other kinds of, of failure events. In, you know, degradates the structural capacity of the, of the structure significantly after the blast event. So I think, and that is bad, but if you basically say that you, the first aim is to stop the structure from failing and, and sort of hurting the people on the inside, um, I guess that's my issue is that is, you know, is delamination a bad thing or is it a fine, you know, I don't care about it basically, you could say, right? I think it depends on your I think about it in different paradigms of blast protection. One paradigm is prevent perforation at all costs. And I did notice when you were talking that when you said failure, what you meant was perforation or, or fracture. And, and that, is, that is an absolutely um, completely valid way of looking at blast loading, particularly if you're looking at vehicles and saving people's lives from, from gunfire or IEDs detonated at the side of the road or whatever. The last thing you want is that stuff getting inside the vehicle. But there are other potential paradigms of blast um, performance where what you also want to think about is the loading that gets transmitted through a structure to another place. Um, and in that case, you kind of take perforation not happening as a given and then look at what are the other potential effects that could be happening here. So excessive deformation um, in certain conditions can be just as harmful as perforation because of what's because it's impacting on some critical system. 
I agree. You know, I think so it would just help if we defined what is the design criteria, i.e., what is the failure design criteria. One of the things that makes it so complicated with blast loading is that there are multiple possibilities for what is the threat and where the people are. You can be looking at different failure in inverted commas. Perforations are, is definitely a critical thing that you want to avoid, but also excessive defamation can be a problem. Um, delamination is probably not a big problem, but if you're trying to model what's happening to the structure, it is important to take account of that because the energy is going there instead of somewhere else. Uh, this is uh, Dr. Fadi from Tawazan. Just a quick question. Uh, uh, regarding the simulation and modeling for the uh, glass fiber, uh, um, uh, the reinforced material with the glass fiber, have you, uh, Doctor, considered uh, the, um, uh, the, uh, to simulate or to model the uh, material um, you know, in the longitudinal direction versus the transverse direction because characterizing the material uh, the properties would differ, you know, uh, during um, specifically for, you know, kind of like impact type of uh, uh, simulation and modeling events. Um, and uh, if so, to to what extent uh, um, you have uh, considered uh, the, the the properties of the material from the longitudinal to the transverse direction uh, versus the transverse direction. Um, uh, also, uh, I know that, um, you know, people in the past have uh, even uh, considered uh, uh, simulating um, uh, the, uh, the plastic material for every um, for every single like they've been digitizing the materials so uh, the material itself so each stress strain curve would be for each point on the uh, plastic material because the fiber orientation uh, from one point to to another adjacent point would uh, would differ. Uh, depending on the mold flow and how you are, um, you know, uh, uh, depending on the mold flow uh, and how this has been been produced, the the material has how how it's been produced. Uh, in the industrial side, um, you know, I mean, there are complex shapes versus you know, in the the university, it's only like a specimen, so probably the orientation would be uniform. But when you are producing a complex part, you know, the fiber orientation would be. Uh, um, would be different. It would be just uh, going in different directions. Um, Adi, you, you are absolutely right that the orientation of the fibers in the different directions changes. And um, one of the challenges with trying to model it is to try and characterize that correctly. Um, so far, because of the size of these models, we've tended to take an approach where we have homogenized across the two fiber directions and sort of taking an average of the two, which I know is not accurate. And um, particularly for a plus minus 45 degrees, it's not. And um, because the properties there change a lot. Um, my main focus has been experimental um, and have tended to partner with others to look at the modeling. Um, but we do have this issue between what we, can, what we can realistically run and what we can model. I mean, Vikram spoke a little bit about this as well, where he talked about um, his models, um, where he's modeling down to, to the ply level um, it, and whether we can reproduce those in engineering scale models we can't at the moment. Um, I don't know much about your digitization approach. It sounds very interesting and maybe a way forward. So I'll be keen to hear more uh, about that. Uh, th th there are some software, but it's uh, it's uh, uh, pretty uh, um, uh, pretty specific to certain uh, uh, to certain companies who are working in like uh, advanced stuff. Uh, they produce their own uh, software um, that will be able to look into um, basically um, every single point on the plastic material to to exactly. Um, uh, to exactly model uh, the, the, the material. So they have an exact prediction uh, of the behavior uh, once there's an impact uh, on the reinforced plastics. Because each, each, each fiber orientation uh, would be different even if they are close to each other, uh, I mean, in terms of distance. So um, the stress-strain uh, stress curve uh, uh, value uh, would be different from from one to to another. Um, yeah, but it's not commercially. These things are not commercially available. 
However, what I know that uh, some of these software are uh, also uh, at, uh, used uh, side to side with commercial finite element software. So um, basically uh, you could um, interchangeably uh, put, have your inputs in there and then it will use that software to do the calculation and then get, come back to the FEA software after that. So, yeah. I don't recall the, the names. It's been, I mean, 10 years ago, I've been you know, involved in that. But uh, if you're interested, I can uh, find, find the names for, uh, for this software. Um, there are two of them, I recall, that they do this work. Thank you. Um, I've, seen, I've seen some of that in some um, manufacturing um, type software where they're trying to simulate the manufacturing of the uh, complex parts but I haven't seen it used in high rates applications. That would be interesting. Thank you. Great. Thank you. Uh, thank you very much. Indeed. So